Hi, my name is Carter Anderson, and today we're going to be talking about internalizing injustice and how to recover from it. Because bigotry is so pervasive in American culture, its targets, minority groups like people of color, women, immigrants, and queer people, often unintentionally adopt the values that lead them to enact harm upon themselves and their community. But finding power in one's own identity and reclaiming it from what society has dictated is a way to overcome this injustice and find one's own sense of justice and peace. Internalized injustice is not simply a harmful concept that people must contend with, but rather a destructive force that becomes part of one's identity through social conditioning and conformity. Oppression is part of the identity of society, and therefore becomes ingrained in the identities of individuals. This social conditioning makes people who have all conformed to the same oppressive ideals, just like the carbon copies in Nick Susanis's Unflattening. Like the journey of the protagonist of Unflattening, freedom from this internalized oppression can be found in a remaking of one's identity, or self-actualization. This chart shows how internalized injustice is materialized. The mental schema is determined by the beliefs of society, which translate into the individual and manifest in behaviors and moods or emotions that make people actively oppress themselves. The self-schema stage is the point of the self-established injustice, where oppression becomes internalized and a fixed aspect of identity. This photo by artist Jahi Chikwendu shows how whiteness is imposed on black people and the violence that comes with it. It begs the question, is their pain self-imposed or is it a result of whiteness? Can it be both? Being socialized as a minority in an oppressive society directly leads to self-hatred and believing bigoted and incorrect ideas. When oppressing your group is not only the norm, but is even encouraged and celebrated, it seems there is no choice but to join in. This applies to every oppressed group in America, from women, queer people, people of color, immigrants, the disabled. In literature, Naomi Munawira's Island of a Thousand Mirrors comes to mind as the Tamil characters, a minority in the majority Sinhala Sri Lanka, grow up with the oppression woven into their character. This later manifests in retaliatory hatred and violence. This graphic shows how injustice is internalized through socialization. External forces cause an atmosphere of oppressive ideals, which the targets eventually adopt. Systemic forces like the media and police brutality physically impose these beliefs onto people. This diagram shows all the levels of socialization, and bigotry can exist at all of them, from the microsystem of the family to the macrosystem of the surrounding culture. It is the combined efforts of all of these spheres through a variety of actions that socialize and condition internalized oppression. Internalized oppression is often an inherent part of the minority experience due to the proliferation of hatred of minority groups. The unavoidability of internalized injustice is part of what makes it so destructive, At one point or another, everyone in the marginalized group will have to face this problem, which doesn't immediately go away, or ever go away, but is a constant struggle for those affected. Take driving a car as an example. On a freeway, you can drive for hours without stopping at a red light. However, to get to your destination, you'll reach a stoplight at some point, even if it's just once. Stopping the car is like experiencing the bigotry that becomes internalized. Some face it rarely, while some are forced to stop at every light. Going through a single red light does not mean that you are safe from future red lights either. Either way, it is inevitable and a reality that each person must face, be it reacting calmly or with road rage. And internalized oppression can manifest in self-deprecation, fear, isolation, and violence. Everyone reacts to the trauma of internalized oppression differently, but turning to substance abuse and suicidal thoughts is unfortunately a common phenomenon. This impacts both the individual and the community, ultimately expanding the negative impact of internalized injustice. Dealing with these negative traits often leads to addiction and suicidal thoughts, which disproportionately impact targets of social oppression, as shown in these charts. Often these traits combine and make it much more dangerous to simply exist in society. And, paired with the lack of social safety nets, it's even worse. Internalized oppression, particularly among racial minorities, is passed down from generation to generation by way of the negative traits that it manifests. Although internalized oppression is taught by society, coping with it is taught by families and communities. The stress of internalizing bigoted beliefs about oneself becomes shared by the group, and both toxic coping mechanisms and traits become adopted by others, making this system cyclical. It is important to note that inheriting internalized racism, for example, is more frequent than inheriting internalized homophobia, 
as one is genetic and the other isn't. James Baldwin himself grapples with this inherited racism in Notes of a Native Son and discusses the way his father behaved, suffering at the hands of external and internal racism. The pain of this was passed on to Baldwin, who had already had to interact with racism on every level, causing him even more pain. Unfortunately, this is a common occurrence. The ripple effect demonstrates how the intensity of one person's suffering at the hands of external and internal oppression directly impacts others. The ripples can reach far, and the wave of toxic behaviors and reactions to oppression is felt by many in the family and community. Internalized oppression exists throughout families, as those grappling with injustice often impart their own trauma onto their children, who already have internalized problems to deal with. This creates a legacy of suffering and coping behaviors, that worsening the problem and making it all the more cyclical. Internalizing injustice sets a precedent of limitation in one's own life holding people down and preventing them from exploring their own identity. It is self-perpetuating, in that because these concepts were made to oppress and prevent people from gaining any power, when they are enacted upon oneself, they create a spiral of destructive thinking and action that stops them from achieving self-actualization or really any development in society. Conveniently, this is exactly what the oppressors want to impose. The journey from simple pessimism to powerlessness is quick, and shows how the negative thoughts that accompany internalization can lead to the end of autonomy. Action against oppression is powerful, but when social oppression has removed passion and power, minorities are repressed even further. Internalization holding people down makes it easier to blame the targets of oppression for their own struggles, even though it is the internalization of social constructs that is at fault. The idea that oppressed minorities are at fault or for, for their own lack of education, wealth, social status, is blatantly incorrect and simply worsens the problem. In reality, it is oppressive society as a whole that causes the mental problems of internalization and the external problems of physical barriers to any kind of advancement. Recognition of internalized oppression is the first step in it rejecting it, but because there are constant reminders and reinstatements of prejudice, this proves incredibly difficult and much easier said than done. Being aware of internalized oppression is important, but taking action to combat it is especially hard when one lives in the society that imposes this injustice. There is no way to break free if the source of the problem still remains. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. references this in his letter from Birmingham Jail, and that the ignorance of the white moderate is one of the central villains in the civil rights movement. Their constant pushback to every idea he had, even if it wasn't that radical, is what made his vision seem impossible. For example, take a migraine. Migraines are both caused and intensified by loud sounds and bright lights. So, by staying in a bright, loud environment, one can never get relief. In terms of injustice, the constant acts of oppression, from blatant hate crimes to microaggressions, are the stimuli that harm and keep harming individuals. If people don't leave these places, at least on an emotional level, there is no way to reject oppression. Therefore, rejection of hegemonic society distances people from this oppression and allows them to look into themselves and, more importantly, their community for support. Finding refuge among one's own people and culture both separates them from the oppressors and provides them with the support to learn and grow. This doesn't have to be a physical separation from society, but more of an emotional return to one's roots. It is only after they connect with their heritage, their peers, and their collective knowledge can they begin to develop their identity past internalized injustice. In Toni Morrison's Song of Solomon, the character Milkman learns to fly with the help of his aunt, Pilot, shown here on the cover. His flight is symbolic of his transcendence of the impact racism has made on his identity, but he could not have done it without the help of others in his family and community. Morrison's main teaching is that when we work together, we can grow and truly live away from the oppression of society. The metaphor of a plant growing fits here too. In order to flourish, the plant needs water, soil, and sunlight. People have these certain conditions as well, but they are emotional support, an environment safe from persecution, and self-esteem, all of which can be found when those taking care of the plant, or person, are equipped for the job. A person's culture is often the best group to help them grow and achieve the necessary self-actualization to become truly separated from this internalized injustice. Turning to one's own culture and transcending what society enforces allows learning of cultural practices, the formation of constructive relationships, and a discovery of identity that is separate from the identity tainted by internalized impression. 
This oppression alienates and isolates, so forming connections to individuals, the community, and the culture directly works against this and helps to heal. This is a form of self-imposed justice, righting the wrongs that a bigoted society has done to individuals and, from this, allowing people to be secure, free, and self-actualized. Self-actualization is a deep and meaningful connection to one's personal history, the history of their culture, and a state of finding oneself through morality, creativity, problem solving, and an acceptance of facts. Maslow's hierarchy of needs shows how the reformation of identity is reached. When someone has met their physiological needs, has a sense of safety, feels loved, and has self-esteem, they can achieve self-actualization. This is where they have a renewed sense of morality and identity due to the rejection of those social norms and a connection to their community. This stage is key in getting justice for the years of forcibly eternalized oppression that marginalized people have suffered through and is therefore a necessity. As for one's identity, it is no longer held hostage by what society thinks of the person. Self-actualization has no rules for what a person can and cannot be. But a person who has moved beyond oppressive thoughts and is able to create something new for themselves based on their lack of injustice. Armed with cultural support, one must go forth and accept that oppression is a part of society, not as to grow resentful, but rather impassioned, and continually fight against it as to prevent inward and outward oppression from continuing. The recognition of and fight against societal oppression is different once someone has become self-actualized. Although bigotry still impacts the individual, they are equipped to handle it and reject any internalization of injustice. They can find a place for themselves within society as a whole and continue the fight against injustice from a more secure and empowered place. Again, in Notes of a Native Son, James Baldwin defines these two concepts as integral to understanding one's place in society as a minority. It is important to recognize that self-actualization is not universally freeing. Even though you have rejected internalized injustice, External injustice still exists and still impacts you. Because of this, the fight must go on. People must use their self-actualized selves and ideas to fight against oppression for themselves and others. This is another form of community support and, with hope, will lead to even more self-imposed justice. The upward spiral of self-actualization parallels the downward spiral of internalized oppression. Once people have grown and redefined themselves, they can use this new sense of self to combat social oppression and they can journey from positivity all the way to freedom and find freedom for their communities too. This is how internalized oppression can be reversed and through justice, true liberation can be made. Thanks so much for listening. My name is Carter Anderson and I hope you enjoyed this journey of internalized oppression and overcoming it.